Hello, everyone. Um, and uh, well done for making it to the final session of a marathon two weeks. Um, and uh, we're finishing with a review of uh, what's happening in Americas. Um, over the next hour, we'll be discussing um, the market all the way from Canada down to uh, Argentina and right throughout. Um, so uh, quite a, a landmass to cover, but um, we've got a great panel to help us to do that. Um, well, before I introduce them, I'll urge you, as usual, to um, ask plenty of questions. Uh, you know how to do that by now, so look on the panel to your right and um, please ask as many questions as you can and I'll uh, get to those as we discuss uh, this topic. So um, before I do that, I'm going to ask um, each panellist to very briefly introduce themselves and I'll start with Paul. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Rupert, and I've got uh, two, over 20 years experience in the messaging business, uh, having been inside some of the world's largest aggregators, as well as some of the most pioneering interconnect vendors uh, across a number of different functions in terms of commercial scale and strategy. And uh, I've also been an advisor, strategist, consultant to enterprises in the space who are looking at uh, means to be able to broaden their mobile channel engagement. And I look forward to a great conversation this morning. Excellent, many thanks. Now, John. Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to be here. Thank you. Um, I'm the CEO of TMT Analysis. Um, TMT Analysis provides uh, in this market routing information, primarily uh, mobile number portability data um, and HLR routing information um, and we do that across uh, Latin America is a really important market for us. I think we've got every every um, number portability market in, in Latin America. Uh, it's obviously a, re a really growing market and also uh, more importantly possibly to the future identity management services both um, within Latin America but also between Latin America and, and Spain in particular. Um, so that is me in a nutshell. Great. Well, we'll definitely be coming back to identity issues uh, later on. Um, Great. Meantime, um, Diego. Uh, hello. Good morning. Uh, I've been with uh, uh, Bonage and Next Movie Four for the last uh, seven years and, and a half, almost, taking care of our connectivity in the region. Before that, I've been with Ibasis for a couple of years. So I've been also in the market for messaging, connectivity uh, for quite a long time now, always taking care or my, my, on my home region, which is Latin America, from Mexico to Argentina, where I'm based. So thanks, me, thanks for inviting me. Perfect. You're very welcome. Um, Antonio? Oh, good afternoon. Hey, my name is Antonio Ordax. Uh, I'm working in TIUS. TIUS stands for the Telefonica International Wholesale Services, which is the international carrier for Telefonica. I've been working in Telefonica for more than 10 years. And currently I'm managing uh, the business development of uh, SMS uh, messaging and customer engagement. Great. Uh, Clive? Hi, good afternoon. Um, so Clive Steady, I've been working with um, Annam for the last six or seven years, uh, focusing on sales. Um, we work primarily with mobile operators on messaging solutions, and a good bit of our time is taken focused on uh, helping operators with ATP monetization, security, and routing. Um, so it's very nice to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, Gabriel. Hi, good afternoon and good morning uh, to all. My name is Gabriel Pajwanski. I have over 20 years of uh, telecom experience working from um, companies like Verizon, Telecom Italia, to Telefonica, uh, to software vendors like uh, CSG, and um, always in the voice and SMS side of the business. Now I'm heading here the, the business development for the Americas, for Morica Group a uh, New Zealand-based aggregator focusing on carrier relations and new market penetrations. Great. Well, it sounded like one long job interview, didn't it? So um, you're all on to the next stage. 
which is um, me asking you a bunch of questions about the Americas. So um, let's start with the, the, the obvious one, uh, which is um, what's happened this year, um, what kind of uh, impact COVID has had, what new trend, trends you've seen developing and what maybe has uh, come to a grinding halt. So John, you, you were saying that you're active in every country pretty much of LATAM. So what have you seen? So, you know, our, our specific uh, sort of niche, if you like, is, is mobile number portability. And we've seen that uh, not really change enormously dramatically because of COVID, but it's, it's just gradually increasing market by market. Um, and some of the, some of the smaller countries, uh, you know, who've adopted recently have, have continued to see increasing porting numbers, which is great. Um, in terms of the impact that we've seen on the actual um, messaging going particularly into uh, South America internationally, which is where we tend to see the, the queries and the requests for our routing information, uh, we've seen significant growth. I mean, the, mainly in the biggest markets, so Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, um, Chile, but I mean, re really significant growth, 25, 30% um, sort, of, sort of growth over last, uh, over last year at least in terms of um, primarily US to uh, Latin America or Europe to Latin America. Um, although sometimes it can be difficult to deduce those things because the big social networks or some of the big players are bringing traffic backwards and forwards um, but yeah we're seeing significant aggregate growth and the, the really good thing from our perspective we're actually really starting to see some of the fraud issues um, be dealt with um, not necessarily successfully dealt with but um, uh, dealt with or starting to be dealt with so we see in increasing issues around um, port fraud increasing issues around sim swap fraud um, and you know really the really good news is some of the MNOs, you know, Telefonica's on the call, really starting to, to roll out some uh, product uh, to help the market with that around um, API access to the to the CRMs. Um, so we're, yeah, we're seeing one incre massive increase in traffic um, and on the identity space, in interesting uh, logics now where a lot of the, particularly the fintechs doing over the top banking type services, particularly Spain, Portugal, uh, very interested in whether their customers are in Latin America or, or in Spain and Portugal, for example, very simple identity type, type mm -hmm. checks, roaming versus domestic, um, you know, how recently was the, the SIM changed, uh, you know, call forwarding checks, you know, those types of types of checks and types of problems becoming more um, more readily talked about, I think, which is great. And uh, no no death of SMS uh, anytime soon uh, would be, the, uh, uh, be the, the snapshot, I think. Well, we, we are going to mostly concentrate on messaging today. I should have said that at the beginning. Um, we've just had a, an hour or so of um, a voice conversation. So uh, we're going to stick mostly with messaging and uh, John's going to put a new light bulb in uh in his in his light fitting over there um, it's not recorded <laughs> diego what about you um have you seen similar amount of growth and um what uh what areas if if you have seen growth have they come from again unmute <laughs> with it with it and and as john said i think that one of the key drivers for this at least in Latin America, is that you, you need to think that Latin America was far behind US or Europe in digital uh, usage. I mean, applications, uh, I was telling the other day an example of people still, for example, going to collection offices to pay their utility bills. And obviously with the lockdown, all of these offices were closed and people and new applications started to appear for uh, making it easier for all of us, uh, especially people who are not used to do uh, digital payments, wire transfers, uh, new applications, delivery applications that were already here, but not with the uh, massive adoption that we started to see. Um, so all these applications started to drive growth in 
two-factor authentication, payment confirmations, uh, booking, confir uh, not booking, I mean, uh, delivery confirmation. So uh, I think that most of the growth came from the digital adoption uh, that we started to see in countries where we are still, you know, more used to go to the old shop on the corner to do our grocery shopping or to do our payments in the bank. And so, and also companies uh, trying to rebuild their logic, their applications to start delivering uh, better communication with their customers, uh, which was maybe left behind uh, in the normal situation. Was there um, was there a lockdown in all countries across Latin America? Mm, yeah, I would say. Really? In fact, in Argentina, we're still in official lockdown. <laughs> what 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 kind of lockdown is it? Uh, what restrictions? Flexible, <laughs> flexible <laughs> lockdown. I would say, but yeah, yeah, most of the countries. Yeah, I would say maybe it was shorter or longer in in different countries, but back in March or, or April, most of the continent or the subcontinent was uh, uh, locked down. It's hard to believe we're having this conversation, isn't it? It really is. Um, Antonio, um, what kind of, um, wh where do you see the growth? Where have you seen the growth this year? Um, the most dramatic growth in your territories, which, which are sectors in the use cases? Hey, yes, uh, I guess that uh, as Diego has mentioned, during the second quarter of the year, the, the number of uh, SMS traffic it was decreased. Uh, our statistics saw a decrease around 25-30% of the traffic. So once the, the, the situation has a, a slightly improved, the traffic has increased, but the, the pace is, is a slow. So we are really expecting uh, to see how the market evolves in the, the end of the year. There are a lot of expectations around the Black Friday, Blue Monday, and the Christmas campaign. So we, we are expecting to see how these uh, first campaigns during November uh, evolve. And based on that, I, I guess that we can have a clear picture. Uh, my, my expectation is that uh, we, we are going to be still far from the figures that uh, we were managing by the end of last year. Improving, but uh, uh, at a slow, a slow pace. So if there was a 25% fall, then um, was that because of sectors like retail and um, aerospace and so on? Yes, I guess that uh, in the A2P market is a mix of, of, of products. No? You have the, uh, the, the OTP, uh, Second factor authentication on SMS, but also you have a lot of promotional uh, SMS. So those uh, that are related with the with the, the leisure activities, with travel and so on, most uh, have disappeared. And uh, we have seen that uh, in some way this has been compensated with the increase in the in the other sectors, but it's not uh, fulfilling the, the gap. So. What about you, Clive? Perception of the market. Have you? Well, um, <laughs> I mean, do you see those some of those markets coming back, or do you think we'll just have to get used to uh, those sectors being, um, you know, t staying sort of at low low levels? Uh, we've kind of seen a bit of. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm no. turning off to you. No, no, go go, on, Clive. Um, I mean, we've seen a, a bit of a different situation when we look at international. Uh, message, A2, A2P messaging compared with domestic. So with the international traffic, we found that mainly um, in markets which have had a national lockdown, we've seen quite a bump um, around the time of the start of that lockdown. So we've seen sort of typically sort of 15% growth in international A2P. Um, in countries which have just done regional lockdowns, the effect is, is not really so pronounced. Um, obviously, it's different uh, country by country, and we sort of think it's probably to do with, you know, more social media engagement, etc. On the domestic side of things, obviously, some sectors are down, but we've seen a lot of um, messaging just related to the COVID situation. So government messages and also promotions around 
COVID related um, uh, items, etc. And overall domestic in most of our, our customers has been pretty flat. So overall, it's been, uh, we've seen a bit of a lift. Um, against the background of sort of steadily increasing HP volumes over the past year or two. So there's a kind of a trend up way, uh, upwards, but if you map on the kind of um, uh, sort of rise of COVID cases and the lockdown, you kind of see a, a similar trend in the international side of the ATP traffic that we're, we're looking at. And well, so far we haven't, um, we haven't seen it fully drop back. So obviously the initial bump is quite big when you get lots of government messages uh, out there, but it, um, the volumes aren't coming back to, the, to where they were at the start. So we've seen a general, general upward trend on the international especially. Gabriel, have you seen um, the government sector, uh, a big, big spike there? In the government sector? Yeah. Um, we've seen, in, I guess, they're pushed into digitalization, meaning that now they're relying on SMS uh, for communication, uh, for people to confirm if they have or not the virus, for example, um, to manage queues um, in, uh, in their centers for, I don't know, passport, for example, renovations, those kind of things. Um, certainly, governments have now pushed more, uh, I, mean, I mean, at a faster rate, similar to, I would say, uh, retail and um, enterprise into getting things more on the digital and virtual way of responding or communicating with their clients, so to speak. Um, I'm not sure what the other um, colleagues of mine have seen here. Um, my take is there, we already in the digitalization age. Uh, we, which was forced into because of COVID. Obviously, it was a, a slow transition into it, especially in LATAM, unlike North America, I would say. But now I see more and more every entity from government to enterprise quickly trying to adopt uh, and catch up with the digitalization age. And by the digitalization, I mean using applications, cloud-based, um, and telecom solutions like SMS for delivery of notification, security, uh, or just information, um, instant information communication, I would say. And do you have any examples of um, companies or verticals that have you know, discovered the power of, of SMS in, in, in lockdown that were, maybe weren't using it before? Certainly. I mean, I've seen it in other countries and now we're trying to replicate it in LATAM. Um, as you, I'm not sure if you know, but Monica is based in New Zealand. New Zealand has been one of the leading countries in managing or trying to manage very well the COVID situation. We've seen the, the use of uh, SMS there, for example, for um, checking in on people that have the, the virus to make sure that they're in their property and not leaving their property to potentially get someone else sick. So it's more like controlling the population. So it's in, the, in a sense, the value of constant communication with the sick uh, so that they can manage well the spread of the virus. And I have seen that in LATAM, some governments have trying to push on that system, maybe not successfully uh, because of the mere size also for some of the countries. Um, but I've seen more and more government um, entities trying to adopt uh, SMS as a, as a channel for one, communication, and two, also for, like, for example, making appointments, confirming appointments, or, or a queue of, of, of a line for be, being attended. But I think there's a big curve for them, um, and they are trying to go that way, but I think there's still some time for them to really adopt that uh, the system is something that they just were cut off car, so to speak, um, in, in a sense, because of uh, COVID. Well, there you are, A to P messaging, using, uh, governments using it to enforce a police state and uh, surveillance of people leaving their houses. So you heard it here first. Um, well, well, let's come to Paul. Um, yeah, you, Tim, uh, I, you, I didn't, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, yeah, I'm just going to say, yeah, we've got a lot of experience here, but I, it'd be 
difficult to match yours. And so you must have seen quite a lot <laughs> in your in your time um, in the messaging space in the US. So what about this year? What's uh, what are your main observations? Yeah, you know, um, as Lennon said, there are decades when nothing happens. And sometimes there are weeks when decades happen. Yeah. And we're in one of those periods right now. Um, you know, you were asking uh, Gabriel about what segments you saw as mm -hmm. emerging users of enterprise messaging. One of the things that uh, I've been exposed to is the customer care world in terms of one of my clients. And um, interestingly enough, uh, Telefonica Peru went through a process where they completely outsourced their uh, in on-premise um, customer care operations within a three-day period. Uh, and I became aware of this only because I was sitting in on an analyst call with some other customer care followers, and they had a presentation made by one of the guys from Telefonica Peru. So what's happened here is that so much of the traffic that used to be uh, IVR-driven or voice-driven is now shifted into messaging. And going back to Gabriel's comments earlier, as well as Diego's, in terms of the increased speed in which the adoption of digitalization is now flowing through enterprises of all stripes and colors. Uh, and that's obviously, you know, as I say, I came across this one example in Latin America, which I was really astounded in terms of the, um, the quickness and the speed in which they were executing it on. Um, and it was an operator. Uh, and then moreover, it was in Latin America. So that's, you know, one more data point, if you would. And, and what about um, you know, general volumes in the US, are you seeing um, what's, how's, what's been the impact um, of all the lockdowns and so on? on, on uh, it, you know, this volumes? is one of those, it depends. You know, there are winners and losers in the dynamics. Um, uh, I'm, I believe Nick, Nick Lane spoke earlier, perhaps yeah. yesterday, uh, but the MEF actually has a, a report that he issued, I think last month, the month before, where he was tracking data on COVID behavior and COVID, uh, the impact on messaging performance across a number of different countries across the world. And one of the things that I noticed, you know, if you were in, uh, let's say, the hospitality world, marketing, gambling, you couldn't have been in a worse situation where everything was shut down and messaging went to essentially zero. And then there are other dynamics and other, um, other segments, as I say, like in customer care that was starting to go through the roof. Um, so it really kind of depends on where you are, not only the geographies, um, as well as what segments you are. I'm a believer that, you know, in most cases, people are people. In the case, in, and what I mean by that is by looking at, and, you know, if you want to leverage my experience, well, okay, I'll, I'll say that everyone kind of behaves the same in terms of our human interaction. It may be a little bit more higher in some countries that have a higher a higher percentage of youth in their population, but we all still kind of behave the same. It just may not be at different levels because of the regions in which you're involved in the, the meaning the states and the populations that you're involved in. Um, US operations, you know, we're now starting to come out of the COVID dynamics. And as I recall, I remember seeing that during COVID, uh, SMS kind of to drop down, but then RCS usage started to peak. And now that we're out of the lockdown, we're back to you know, uh, SMS continuing to perform at those high levels. RCS, not so much so. Um, you know, what I would probably say is if you really want to get into it, reach out to Mobile Square to go back to look at those uh, reports that was published through the MEF just last month. Yeah, well, um... It was an interesting uh, conversation with Nick, and um, we can. I was planning to come back to some of his numbers, especially re uh, relating to grey traffic, um, as we um, get, get go ahead with the discussion. But um, so many topics to talk about. Um, maybe John, I can come back to you. And you know, you, you talked a little bit earlier about fraud. About the, you think that the fraud is is being tackled to some extent. Can you maybe elaborate on the progress you, you've seen? Well, I'm not sure tackled's the right word, but uh, sort of addressed, possibly. Yeah. Um, so I think if you if you look sort of top down, uh, you know, in in America's, um, you know, in across Canada, um, all the big U.S. networks now have launched um, really quite good 
APIs to their uh, CRMs to provide um, account takeover protection, uh, SIM swap, um, call forwarding, fraud, uh, sometimes know your customer type um, applications or, or match applications. And so the, the data sets that are available in the US and in Canada in particular are quite ubiquitous. And one of the big problems for getting the, the ultimate end owners of the risk, so the credit agencies, the credit card companies, the banks, to um, to engage with with fraud solutions for for OTP, uh, ATP are um, about ubiquity usually, because it doesn't really help them if one network in Ecuador has a solution but no one else does, because of course they don't know which which number belongs to which network, and so um, there's a there's a ubiquity uh, which has been driven I think really quite well in the US. And there's tons of market players. You've got people like Prove, uh, former Payphone, Boku, Zamigu. There's a, there's, a, there's a whole layer of of players offering those types of products, as well as your, your traditional sort of new stars and, and iConnectives. Um, so I think yeah, there's a there's a there's an increased understanding, possibly by because then you know the CEO of Twitter is getting his phone hacked. Uh, you know that that things are moving and i also actually do finally see a bit of light from the big guys the social networks who i think are actually realizing that actually they start to need to do some checks particularly on important customers to know who they are um, and obviously that's not going to be mass market yet but it's certainly starting and so yeah we, we see we see progress i think the big the big uh, mobile groups are, are engaging with it now. It's probably push from the regulators as much as it is commercial uh, opportunity, but uh, the, the mobile networks are engaging with it as well. So yeah, it's definitely a different market than it was a year ago around our specific bits of fraud around identity management of of the users and, and whether or not they're really who they say they are, or, or if that if that um, number or that device looks suspicious um uh, we're seeing quite a lot of progress in in that space um obviously the gray root type stuff is is a different problem um but the the identity theft uh fraud aspects are gradually getting a bit better um but they're certainly not fixed by by any any means so antonio uh, john's talked a little bit there about uh ways to solve fraud or to address it. What do you, do you see fraud becoming a bigger problem in the Latin American region? Are there, and, and if so, what kinds of fraud uh, are on the rise? Uh, yes, I, I agree that uh, fraud is the, the, the main issue for the A2P market. I mean, uh, we have seen a lot of uh, gray routes in Mexico, Brazil, Peru, Colombia. It's difficult to determine how much is that, but uh, I guess that this morning in one of the sessions, uh, someone from a while square points that it could be around 35, 40%. I, I, I agree that uh, it's, it's, a, it's a valid figure. And uh, Telefonica, and not only Telefonica, many other MNOs in, in the region are deploying their uh, anti fraud solution, SMS firewalls, just to protect and to, to close those. Uh, those great rules. Uh, we are doing so in, in Mexico, in Brazil, and I know that in other countries, they are also deploying the data solutions. It is clear that uh, there is a big, big difference between the legal rules and the great rules. Uh, sometimes the, the prices are 10 times less, so uh, it's not fair that the, the, the mobile network operators pay for, for the infrastructure and in others once capturing the revenue. So I guess that uh, in some way we need to protect from, from, from those attacks. So Antonio has just brought up the topic of, of grey roots there. Um, when Nick was speaking, Nick Lane was, speak, was speaking this morning on um, uh, giving his forecast, he was talking about about 35% of all traffic being um, grey at the moment and, and staying that way for quite a few years to come. So Gabriel, I'll come to you. What is that? Is that the way you're seeing the market? Do you think those figures are accurate? And um, 
What can be done about gray, gray traffic? Well, in my previous life, um, not life, but work life, um, when I was managing uh, the software as a service fraud detection solution uh, with CSG in the Americas, what I saw was that fraud overall is uh, is going to be here to stay. I don't see that going away um, that that soon. It's been here for decades since I've been in the telecom industry. It is a whack-a-mole uh, game, I would say, because you close one down and then you have 10 pop up on the other side. Um, some countries are better than others at fighting it. Obviously, it's always going to be dependent upon the rate, as long as there is a margin to be won because of rate difference between local and international termination. There's always going to be a way around fraud. And also, as technology advances, solutions that uh, allow or ability, give the ability to pursue this type of routes they always going to be appearing. Uh, and then there's another factor, um, enterprise customers, they push for price reduction of, uh, all the time. So aggregators themselves seeing themselves forced to use this type of routes to improve their, their cost. Um, however, there is now a trend and I see it of uh, certain customers, particularly I would say uh, on the banking side, credit card, that they are requiring that the route is not great. Uh, for security reasons. And they are asking aggregators to guarantee somehow that the route that they're being used is direct and not bypass. Now, um, there are solutions out there that help to detect that, um, but again, they're very difficult to, uh, to, it's not a direct science, let's say. It's more like an art that you use to detect these routes. Um, but as long as there's that difference in rate, I don't see that going away. There's no solution out there, I would say yet, that is 100% proof that works across all, in, in all countries. Like I said, some operators are being good at fighting it, but there's also internal interest within the certain operators I see, or fights, I would say, uh, between the wholesale team that is trying to protect that, and then there's the marketing local teams that are not fighting it because they're seeing the benefits from the growing traffic coming in through those great routes. So it is like a, you know, it's a tricky, it's a tricky business. Um, and like I said, unless everybody is on board, um, meaning enterprise, aggregators, and mobile operators, and also solution providers, uh, all in sync, it's going to be very difficult to really close it completely, the, the fraud. Um, that's, that's my take on, on that. So yeah, Tim, uh, if, I, if I can ride yeah. on, on Gabriel's coattails, um, you know, we're kind of having a, having a conversation about the what relative to, um, how we do things here. And you have to also look at the why of what's behind all this. So Gabriel really landed right on the spot relative to fraud. Well, we have lots of fraud because we're in a commodity business. That's the reality of what we have to deal with, you know, and the, and the definitions of a commodity are low growth, high volume, and a scenario in which buyers can interchangeably choose between providers with very little difference. So as, as the executives and managers of the companies that we're all associated with and been involved in, what we have to do is figure out how to either bundle different types of solutions, innovate, uh, or segment. And you know, just as what Gabriel was talking about with banks. So there are aggregators now. I mean, there's a great example is Telesign. Over the last three to five years, they've been focusing their aggregator business specifically to identity and financial services customers. All the other stuff, they fired those other customers and had great performance. So much so that this is public knowledge that they are now in a quiet period of being acquired by a private equity firm because the private equity firms thought, hey, we're right at the tipping point here. Let's get on this as an opportunity. So, you know, and, and John's company with TMT Analysis is a great example of how to be able to innovate around a solution. You know, as Gabriel was also talking about, what is the security aspects that we can layer on? And it is 
like cybersecurity, a whack-a-mole business. You're always one step ahead of the bad guys or one step behind the bad guys, depending on how you're looking at it. So that's really the dynamic that we're operating in. Sure, you know, the potential revenues might be upwards of another 30%, but when you have the likes of Facebook and other big players, essentially auctioning off to the lowest priced bidder, that means that the buyers look at what we do as being completely interchangeable. So you got to position what you're offering, your product offering is, with something new, something different, you know, a different way to approach the problem. Well, I mean, that's uh, very eloquently put, and it's obviously uh, something that uh, over the last two weeks uh, everyone's been discussing how how to differentiate your 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 product uh, when. Um, the actual product itself is uh, is 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 on a sort of uh, you're in a price war and it's being commoditized. So, um, Diego, I'll come back to you. What do you do? You get where Paul's coming from, and do you think that um, like what's the best way to uh, to differentiate your your product uh, in a commoditized market? Excuse me. No, I, I agree with them, although. You know, I think that it's true that uh, messaging in the, the actual, the current status is, is a, commo a, it's a commodity. But I think the way we as aggregators are differentiating ourselves is basically with the access. I mean, we need to think that we don't, we, we do the, let's say the, the logistics, the delivery of the message, but also we provide an access to the, for, for an enterprise, for example, to dispatch their messaging. So I think that the way you can attract with better APIs, better information, better statistics, it's a way uh, where we can differentiate between all of the aggregators in front of a potential, uh, a potential uh, customer, an enterprise. Obviously, you will still have the Ubers, the Facebook that will buy the, the cheapest cost available in the market, then to realize that it's not delivering. That's why we still have that 30% fraud or grave routes in the market. But it is also true that the uh, fraud prevention tools are getting smarter because they are learning about the, the patterns, the trends. They are companies not only credit cards, but travel uh, related uh, uh, customers or notifications for social media network that are preferring to pay more for better quality. And also the, and then they can decide, okay, I have all these options, but this is better to develop my application on uh, with, or I get better information with this one. So I think those are the, the, the sides or the, uh, the sides of the business where we can differentiate ourselves. I mean, between aggregators, between competitors. Clive, have you, um, have you seen a market for, is there, are there verticals and sectors out there who are willing to pay a premium for these kind of added value? I, I guess um, I have to confess we see it very, very differently. And it's because, I suppose it's because of the nature of our business. Mm. So when we find a, a potential customer with a lot of grey traffic, um, that's great news from our perspective because we can show them a really good business case to clear that problem up. Um, we find it's not, it's not about dropping a box into the network and hoping that the problem is going to go away. You have to have really skilled uh, analysts that, that spend their whole lives monitoring that stuff, looking for the new threats and addressing them. And we find that there's always a lot of hassle in the early days, but over time it gets a lot easier once you uh, identify the key threats in a particular a particular market, a particular country or network. Um, gradually, they, those issues get um, well not, uh, it doesn't take that long actually, but those issues get addressed in the in the early weeks. And so. We don't really see the situation where there's kind of 30% of gray traffic. We see uh, networks which have loads of gray traffic and networks which have virtually none. Uh, right. It's always a tiny bit, obviously, but you know, we're, 
we're really focused on trying to make sure that everyone has to use the official route. And the good thing about that approach is obviously it brings the quality up for all services. So we're not really, I suppose we're not really looking to differentiate one service compared with another. We're tr trying to make sure that all services are, are of a good quality. And as we do that, we address the other fraud issues as well. So the operators tend to be motivated, in LATAM tend to be motivated around increasing HP volumes and their, their, their um, revenues from that. But at the same time, we're able to address the, the fraud issues, which, um, which is great. So it, it, from a business case point of view, it kind of works quite well. Um, so I suppose- Would a lot of those grey root issues. issues kind of... Say again, uh, Tim? Would, would a lot of those grey root issues go away if there was um, more harmony of pricing? Um, well, probably, but um, I can't really see that happening because there's always going to be people that want to offer um, sim farms, for example, and to to get to get around that. And we've seen um, we've seen major brands using really rubbishy routes, even with very poor quality, obfuscated text, poor you know change sender IDs, and all sorts of garbage in the messages. Um, but um, we we just I mean, not from our perspective, well, we we just try and make sure that the traffic it just goes through the, the official route and, and don't leave any other options. And um, if you focus on the, the biggest sending brands first, obviously you can pick up all of the, virtually all the revenue um, pretty quickly. Why are those brands willing to, you know, put up with crappy service just for saving a bit of money? I'm not, I'm not sure to be honest, Tim, whether they always know um, right. how bad the, the messages are being mangled. Um, in, it seems that in different uh, markets, um, some markets it's worse than others. In, in some markets, we see um, uh, aggregators going to great lengths to to avoid paying effectively by, you know, removing branding. Um, all, there's all sorts of different techniques for for doing it. Um, but fortunately, over time, you, there there's only you know there's there's new, new, new threats all the time, obviously, but um, you can basically address them and and learn as you address them in more than one market. So it's it's getting easier over time. Paul, what's your um, view on um, on the grey route situation, certainly in the US? Um, well, the reality is that there is probably more effort. Uh, to eradicate gray market traffic in the U.S. than in other parts of the world, primarily because, again, the quality of the buyers and the enterprises, et cetera, but we still face those same downward price pressures. Um, and even, you know, we have also a different dynamic in the U.S. where you've got, let's call it, uh, my reference is because I'm in the U.S., offshore versus onshore. So the onshore providers, you know, we've been doing... Um, fraud detection since the inception of messaging. You know, the, the companies that I've been in back in 2002, 2003, we were using uh, fraud detection and uh, gray market eradication as a differentiator for us in the marketplace. So it's a constant in the space. But what's happening now is, as I mentioned earlier, these larger players, these larger buyers are looking for low cost providers so we're now having offshore providers and there's nothing wrong with this. I don't want to think that there's a bad thing just because it's not an American company, not, the, not at all, but they're just based offshore and they want to go after that traffic so that they can get, let's say a branding halo of being able to say, yes, we provide connectivity for the likes of Facebook, Google, Amazon services, Amazon web services, et cetera. So they're using that as a differentiator for themselves and also driving down the market. You know, there's uh, Peter Drucker once said, avoid the trap of a commodity market where you can only be as good as your dumbest competitor. And that goes back to essentially the real premise of what we're all here for today, which is what are the differentiators that we can bring to the market to improve essentially the value proposition from the buyer's perspective, notwithstanding the fact that they are They've got huge buying power in the marketplace where, you know, many of us were, you know, remember the old days where we had all the selling power as opposed to the buying power, which now exists in the space. Um, so that's kind of the, the biggest difference between the two. 
there's just more more efforts more excuse me emphasis on eradicating gray market but at the same time it's being undermined because of the nature of the com the competition in a um, in a commoditized arena um we're getting some questions uh, uh, from the audience um we had one from Rita which is um on this question of uh, quality over commodity <clears throat> she says um or he says I don't know if it's a uh, male or female, but um, the question is um, about enterprise education. Uh, whose job is it to um, to explain to enterprises that uh, there are other issues besides price that they can uh, buy from? So I don't know, maybe I'll come back to... Uh, I mean, I can yeah. jump in on that well, one. Yeah. Because you know, I've advised a number of different enterprises in the process of them acquiring various types of messaging solutions. Um, it, and, and having sold to the enterprises, having been inside a mobile aggregator, it's up to all of us in reality. It's just up to all of us. Uh, I mentioned this last week for RCS, you know, no one's coming, it's up to us. So it, the entire ecosystem, because it benefits the operators, because they're going to be getting revenues out of the direct connections. Um, it benefits the enterprises because the end consumer is going to have a better experience utilizing or having that experience with their, uh, that brand, that enterprise that is trying to get to that end consumer. And obviously it benefits the aggregators because we're essentially being able to differentiate ourselves and move up the value layer proposition so we can get back to, let's call it premium pricing for what we're doing. Um, so that's what, you know, I'm not trying to be evasive, but the reality is it's up to all of us to be able to communicate that message. There's a lack of knowledge uh, in great part from the co enterprise customers know what is the impact of a great route. Most of them don't know what it is. They don't understand it. They just see a, a cheap rate or, at a cheaper rate, but they don't understand how that cheaper rate, the way it's delivered impacts the quality of their service. I believe it is up, like like with Paul mentioning, is a lot up to us, um, the aggregators, uh, the carriers, um, everybody in the ecosystem to spread this knowledge around, um, so people understand uh, in a way or another, either through communication, videos, um, any sort of education material that can be provided, so they understand and start spreading the knowledge so things can then being honed in. Um, obviously, in the case of enterprise, the, the customer facing is, uh, is the aggregator. So it's the aggregator's responsibility towards the enterprise to provide this information, I would say, in this particular case, um, to let them know what is the impact in the quality of the route that will in turn impact their service um, as to why to use a gray route or not. And Tim, if I may, in one of the um, engagements I had, um, sat down with a client and we started identifying all the different buying factors and ranking them relative to who, what vendor we wanted to assess. And one of them, for example, was referrals. And the process, the mindset was, we want to be able to have a partner that's going to be able to open up business to our business, to our core value proposition. Who would be able to do that? Well, a gray market trafficier, trafficier is not going to be able to make referrals to their customer base. You know, and this was a very, very large entity, publicly traded, et cetera. And that was a little bit of an eye-opening experience for me because I had never come into a sales scenario in my past where I said, oh, and by the way, notwithstanding all the technical bits and bytes that we were able to bring to the, uh, the equation here on your behalf, but we'll also make references and referrals to our 1,500 customers that might include everything from United Airlines to, you know, your local pizzeria and Domino's. Hadn't thought of that, but that's, you know, that's, those are the kind of things that I started realizing, okay, we're going to need to look a little differently. And as I say, we started to identify a little over 50 buying factors. So know your customer. So Antonio, you're the uh, you're the MNO on this um, panel. What what, uh, what kind of outreach and education do you do with your enterprise customers? I, I sort of recall that it's difficult to 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 educate the customers. Uh, you try to to convince them that the the 
KPIs in terms of uh, delivery rates, delays, and so on, are things that they should put in the equation. But finally, many, many times, it's a matter of price. Uh, so uh, to me, it's, it's difficult to, to convince the, the, the guys that uh, they should uh, apply. Uh, as I said before, uh, we have uh, seen some change in the mind of some uh, customers. They start to, 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 to ask for, for direct routes. And from Telefonica perspective, is one of the things that we are trying to, to do. Being a MNO, uh, we need to put, to, to put in value the, the, the direct routes. More and more customers are approaching to, to that, but uh, still a lot, a lot of them, finally, it's a matter of, of price. Uh, you, you fulfill the requirement, you explain to them, okay, uh, we are giving you better quality, but finally, uh, purchase uh, teams decide that the price is the, the only driver to make the decision. So I think it, with a combination of the anti-fraud uh, solutions, with both educa education plus the, 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 this kind of solutions, we can convince the customers that uh, there is no other way to, to make business. Okay, well, look, let's, um, let's move on to um, another topic and um, uh, probably uh, an inevitable one, given that uh, all the conversations we've had this week and last, but <clears throat> is there the upgrade pass to RCS um, is that uh, underway in, in Latin America uh, yet? And um, how do you see that uh, playing out? So, Diego, maybe you can, I can come to you on that. I'm not an expert in RCS. In fact, I, I'm still not uh, participating in any uh, approach of this. I, I only heard about Brazil doing something about RCS. Many operators thinking and evaluating, but, but maybe going back to what, where, what we discussed at the beginning, you need to think that Latin America is a region where things move uh, or appear later, more slowly. So I don't see, at least in the countries I usually um, work with, any uh, big approach or active approach for RCS yet. Tony, are you, I think, I believe you had some experience in RCS. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, if you compare Latin against uh, Europe in terms of Telefonica, the, the whole thing is that most of the solutions that are, have been deployed there are Google-based. So the, the interoperability within the operators makes things easier than, for example, in Europe, where there is a mix of, of vendors providing the service. So taking this advantage, I guess that uh, in Brazil and also in Mexico, things are moving. Not uh, so uh, quickly as, we, as uh, we would like, but things are moving. And uh, we, we did uh, two campaigns uh, in March, uh, in March in, uh, also in, in April. The first one was related with the, with the COVID. And uh, we sent uh, more than 4 million of messages to, 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 to access users. So the idea of this campaign was to first uh, to, to provide uh, government information in regards to the status of the, of the, of the, of the pandemic, but also uh, provide uh, offers to, to, the, to the customers uh, that, that they can use during this, this period. It was a very, very successful campaign because uh, uh, more than 95% of the messages were read in the in the first hour. And uh, so we, we believe that, uh, that there is a, a desire to, 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 to move to, to RCS. Nevertheless, uh, we have a, a strategic uh, in Telefonica that is not only pushing for RCS, but also for the, the, the omnichannel uh, channel solutions. So the, the, we should try to, to deliver to, to the customers the, the right uh, message, but not only by SMS or by RCS, could be in other ways, uh, it could be WhatsApp or whatever. So we are thinking and we are working in an omnichannel platform that uh, will be able to, to manage uh, this uh, ecosystem. Can I add my two cents on the RCS? Please do. Okay, so um, in my last two years that I've been in, on, in the aggregator side of the business, I've seen a big drive and push uh, for RCS. Um, we as Modica have been talking directly with Google and developing the RCS on our side. 
but what we've come to see is all dependent upon the mobile operator uh, engagement into RCS. And there's two limitations that I see. Obviously, it is the future. There's no question about it. Uh, that's where things are headed. Just because of the omni-channel uh, solution that it provides um, overall. So can you call it the SMS replacement? I believe so. But there's two things that are very important that will have to take place in order for it to, be, to become the replacement. One is the universal aspect of it. SMS still dominates there. It is across all devices, no matter what it is, um, that it can deliver an SMS. And two is very secure in one sense. RCS still is only being used in Android devices, hasn't been deployed in, in Apple devices. Obviously, there's more markets that impacts more than others. For example, the US where there's a lot of iPhones, um, that will be one of them. But when you go into Mexico, Brazil, Latin countries, um, where Android is more dominant than iPhones, um, then obviously you have a, a more a bigger opportunity there for RCS. I've seen a lot of campaigns um, for RCS in Mexico and Brazil, and now they're trying to expand to the other countries like Colombia and, uh, and Chile and other in the region. But it has been a, a slow process. Nevertheless, I believe from an aggregator standpoint, it is something to keep your eye on. And most, if not all, aggregators are a, already developing their RCS product, um, as well as Antonio mentioned, WhatsApp, right? So WhatsApp is another option, um, but it's called more on the WhatsApp business API. Uh, and that one is directly with Facebook. Unlike RCS, uh, WhatsApp is just, it will work on the app. Um, it doesn't require um, any universal application for it, like the case of RCS. Um, also the handsets, uh, for example, uh, Samsung, um, or those companies that, that do produce Android devices, they're trying, if, not, if I'm not mistaken, by 2023, that all devices come pre-installed, just like SMS with RCS in it. And it won't be just an application that you download. It is something that comes already integrated into the device and it will work automatically. But again, there is a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of things that need to happen in order for RCS to be the dominant and replacement of SMS. And I, I don't see uh, until all those things happen, banks, um, credit cards, insurance, all these companies that rely heavily on the two-factor authentication, um, communication, that they shift over completely to RCS, but it is already happening. It is a transition that a lot of companies are starting to use as a way to be more customer facing uh, on, on the digital side of the business. John, do you have um, a view on RCS? I mean, obviously there's a, uh, you know, certain level of safety with sender IDs and so on and um, encryption, not, not total encryption, but um, what's your view on it? Just a, a more of a comment really, which is, um, mm. You know, I think if you look at the, the particularly the ID space, um, you know, the fixation with with uh, networks to maintain transport businesses rather than moving up the value stack, um, I think should be certainly considered half the problem. You know, it's a, it's not a new problem that one, right? And it's been around for thirty years, and uh, it it's still here, right? And if you look in the and RCS is a really good example of of it. Um, but if you look at things like the ID space, you know, if you do a mortgage check with Experian or Equifax or someone in the US, that probably cost you $200 or something like that, 150, depending on who you are. If you do a, a, a know your customer ping to AT&T, it probably costs you a penny, something like that. Um, but, you know, dramatically uh, different uh, reams of, of, of numbers. But you know, AT and T don't focus necessarily on the penny, rather than carrying the three zeros, uh, one uh, bit of transport across the network. So the capability for for networks to move and use their their scale and their customer bases and their proposition capability uh, it, it has never been their strong point, right? And and I think RCS is a, a good example of of that i think the the point paul made about um telesign is a really good example using using a scoring system for fraud uh on on subscribers 
uh, you know, is, is a really powerful or risk uh, assessment on a number is a really powerful example of the ways that, um, for example, the networks could use their, their data on their own uh, networks and their own subscribers to increase the value of the product to the customers rather than focus on transport. And I think RCS is a good example where, you know, if it's just about new transport, then uh, I don't think, I don't think it'll change in terms of success. If they start thinking about the value add that it can bring in the proposition to the customer, then, you know, who knows who's going to be the winner in that market. But if you look at what Twilio is doing, what, uh, you know, uh, Vonage Nexmo are doing, what uh, Telesign does around adding value into that, into that, a uh, bit of transport, then it's uh, then it's a powerful mix to compete with. Well, I mean, uh, mobile identity um, has been a sort of theme that's come and gone over the years. You know, mobile connect and so on. All these sort of uh, initiatives that we've had over the last few years to establish networks as a kind of verifies of identity. It's, it's an obvious opportunity, but um, whether they'll take it or not, I don't know. But it's now, uh, we're now uh, an hour into this conversation and um, I always say this, but uh, like, you know, I've got this list of topics and uh, it's hard to do justice to them all, but um, that's the nature of the beast. So um, I'm gonna say thank you to everybody and the panel to um, Paul, John, Diego, Antonio, Clive and Gabriel. Um, thank you very much for your insights this afternoon. Thank you everybody for watching. Mm -hmm.